This conference will now be recorded. So let's go ahead and uh, begin. So uh, before we begin, actually, uh, I'd like to provide you guys a little bit of a, a disclaimer uh, due to the nature of all the things that will be presented today. So this educational presentation is for those who are interested to learn about ethical hacking, security, penetration testing, and physical penetration testing. The misuse of the information and or devices in this presentation could result in criminal charges brought against you. I do not promote, encourage, support, or excite any illegal activity or hacking without written permission in general. The author, which is me, and the medium provided, the author, which is Sacramento, will not be held responsible in the event any criminal charges be brought against any individuals misusing the information in this presentation to break the law. All right, so let's, uh, let's proceed. So a little bit of, of myself and why the person of doing this presentation. So my name is David Provinsky. I'm a hacker, penetration, uh, penetration tester, and a, a red teamer. Uh, own the, the business uh, Silver Hackers, which is pretty much an offensive security uh, company. Um, I'm very, very passionate about offensive security. That's pretty much uh, what I do day in, day out. Um, I love CTS, barbecues, and brewskis, if you want to find me more than that sets out. Um, I'm a member of South Florida ISSA and also an active member of Hackman. Um, I have it there, my LinkedIn, if you want to uh, reach out, or also you can reach me through Twitter, Hackbox, Discord, or Promail. And my is 0 x So, um, a lot of people ask me why physical pen testing. Um, my answer to why I perform physical pen testing, I can categorize it in many things. Uh, first of all, it can actually be underestimated by companies. For example, you have these companies that they spend, I don't know, tons, let's say in the dozens or, or tens of thousands of dollars into appliances, into firewalls, into ideas, into ideas, into uh, a SOC monitoring their network 365. But sometimes they don't think about the physical aspect and how it can actually be bypassed or, or they may have a, a weak uh, physical security implemented. Um, it's fun. It's definitely fun. There's nothing more than the thrill that you get let's say at two, three o'clock in the morning, leaving a sticky note saying that you were there on the monitor of the CISO of the company, right? There's no thrill similar to that. Um, it also gives the opportunity to allow, uh, to educate others on physical security and bring the physical security awareness. Like a lot of people think that because they invest hundreds of thousands of dollars on into their network security, that means their, their security is overall well protected. Well, that might not be the case. And also keep in mind that the, in any company, the weakest uh, link in terms of security is us, it's the human beings. Um, also the opportunity of new challenges with the new engagement, like one of you perform engagement on one month, the following month might present a completely different obstacle. And plus uh, me, which I have uh, no kids or anything. I, I love the, the ability to travel, right? I can go anywhere, anytime, no strings attached, and I just love that. So uh, let's go ahead and let's get a little bit more physical. Uh, before I categorize the physical pen testing into five, which I will explain uh, each more in, in depth. So um, starting off, uh, OSINT and social engineering tools. Um, the second will be Wi-Fi pen testing. After we'll touch a little bit on RFID. Uh, one, then after that, one of my favorites, which is the implant devices, and then finally we'll we'll land on lock picking and bypassing techniques and tools. So regarding OSINT and social engineering, a lot of people think that OSINT is uh, everything online. Uh, yes, I mean it is open source, and so just uh, so you do do a lot of online reconnaissance on the target and building facility. Uh, however, a lot of it is also attached to the physical aspect. So for example, in terms of how we characterize under OSINT social engineering, for example, OSINT on the target, um, you would look up uh, on Google Maps, the on satellite view, how the, the building looks 
else on the outside. Um, if you have the opportunity there, uh, uh, on a recent engagement actually, you can actually do a virtual tour of the inside. Um, if by any chance you have the IP of your target, you might be able to see their the IP cameras, like the show them, for example. And uh, by any chance, if they have their IP cameras with deep credentials, guess what? You're going to have an inside view of the building. Uh, second thing to touch, dress accordingly. Whenever you're doing a, a physical contest, a lot of people might think that due to the fact that I may be going into a building at 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, that I may be wearing camouflage, tactical gear, and all that stuff. Um, not really. That's not really the case. Like, for example, if you're doing social engineering during the day, that you might uh, be trying to see what their ID badges look like, because they have always in order to copy it or phone it or whatever. You actually want to dress accordingly to dress in and not to not blend out. You, know, you don't want to be wearing all tactical and, and it might catch the attention of someone and, and, and they might think otherwise that you're not supposed to be there and whatnot. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that whenever you're doing social engineering and you're interacting with someone, it's always good to have an excuse, a valid excuse to be there. For example, um, if it's an office that you're trying to get into, and uh, let's say they have a building manager or whatever, um, you could try to do some research on who does the maintenance of the building, and then you might pass by the office and say, oh, yeah, I'm part of the a maintenance team, I'm just doing an inspector or whatever. And then at the same time, you can use a clipboard and pen and say that you need to check some, I don't know, some uh, fire extinguishers or some piping or plumbing or whatever, whatever. In the office, you can come up with an excuse to be there. Um, regarding the badges, it is uh, a good idea to, to have one with you. It gives uh, more of a professional look. However, those might be expensive. Quite expensive, in my opinion. For example, if you look up on Amazon or eBay for a, a badge maker, like one of the cheapest ones that I've seen, they come around around eight hundred, nine hundred dollars um, for a badge. I mean, if you're going to use it multiple times for different badges and different contests, then absolutely go for it. But if not, I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend it into that. Um, there, there could be the, 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 actually there might be the cheaper solutions out there. So um, let's go ahead and move on to sort of a more of an interesting stuff. So the Wi-Fi uh, pen testing tools. So here we're going to cover the Wi-Fi pen apples, uh, the Kentana for long range. Uh, credit to, to Will. Well, oh, thank you for my enemy. I've used it many times and I just love it. Um, multiple wireless dongles, uh, the Ponagachi, uh, um, a battery bank, which is recommended. I, I personally use a 25,000 milliamp for most of my devices. And uh, that last line about a project is something you can ask me about it later. So for Wi-Fi time testing, the pineapples. Um, I do strongly recommend using the pineapple for your go-to tool for for Wi-Fi hacking. I mean, it's it's really easy to use. Um, you can set it up as a rogue access point when you have, as soon as you have some people actually connected to you, you can use it as a map of the people. Um, there's plenty of modules to install for it. Um, there's a lot, a lot of forums online if you ever need uh, help troubleshooting it. And uh, also the, the GUI presentation instead of the command line, for example, if, if you're in engagement, you want to present it to a client or whatever, the GUI for taking screenshots, it makes it very, very easy. To, to present to, to anybody, pretty much any non technical people. And also, I love the ability that once the device is actually connected to to, to internet, you can connect it to the C2 server, the remote control server remotely. So you have to be physically within a single location of the pineapple in order to, to administer or manage it. And uh, regarding a uh, personal uh, recommendation for the Wi-Fi pineapple, always carry uh, USB Wi-Fi goes as a backup. Because sometimes uh, you might go too hard on the device and it might break it. Like in a couple of years I've been using it, I may have break it like maybe two, three times, but that's over 20, 30 times use. Um, but it is recommended to carry a couple of, of Wi-Fi dongles as a backup, so, you know, just in case you break it or something on the spot. Uh, this is a screenshot of an uh, example of all the modules. Um, this is not the complete list. There is even more that they, they constantly add. Uh, for example, one that I've used is uh, this one. For example, the Evil Portal is a great module. 
for example, let's say you're hacking the wi of a company and they have landing page for you to log in. As soon as you, you snatch the credentials and you have a copy, you can actually replicate the captive portal. And then as soon as people connect to you, the first thing that they're going to see is that portal where they have to log in. So they put in the credentials. Guess what? Now you have the credentials as well. Um, the DOF attack, that's if you want to be uh, extra friendly with all of your neighbors, if you know what I mean. Um, the Wi-Fi site survey is a really, uh, really great tool to see uh, the, the power of all the devices unless you want to. So yeah, they, they have uh, pretty much a lot of modules that you can actually install and take advantage of. So as I mentioned before, I appreciate Will and for, for helping, uh, helping me with this. So um, this is a container. This is made pretty much from a can similar to a can of Pringles. You can actually use a, a Pringles can. This is for long-range uh, Wi-Fi hacking. Um, personally, I've successfully tested it to slightly over 500 meters. Um, you do have, you must have a, a clear line of view to the target, and um, it can be used with a Wi-Fi dongle. The, the great advantage of this tool to carry within your backpack is that, for example, let's say you're in a, a downtown neighborhood where you have a lot of tall skyscrapers and you have literally no way of accessing, you just find a local coffee shop where you have clearly to the building, just point out to one of the top two buildings, and guess what? You're going to be able to, to pick up Wi-Fi traffic there. So USB Wi-Fi dongles, everybody knows about them. So some of them can actually be used for Wi-Fi hacking. Um, it's easily one of the cheapest items on the presentation. At the time of, of me writing this, I actually saw one on Amazon, which is one of the Alpha's uh, 2.4 and 5 gig uh, range uh, for about $25, which is uh, this small one right here. It's very small, very concealable, portable. Um, I've heard of another brand called Panda, which is supposedly they're really good for packet injection. Well, personally, I have not tried them uh, yet, um, but I've, I've heard uh, good reviews from them. So the Panagachi. Uh, this is something that came out, I'd say, a couple of months ago, and I actually did a presentation on it already. It's a fantastic, fantastic device. Like, once you set it up, it's actually on, on the back end, it's a, a Raspberry Pi, and with a, a screen attached to it. So it was, it's called artificial Wi-Fi hacking. It's a fact that once you install it, you let it run. Like, wherever you take it with you, it'll start scanning for any active Wi-Fi. It'll de off whoever is connected, and as soon as they try to reconnect, they'll automatically capture the handshake in the store for you. Like I've taken this for, for a spin drive around the neighborhood and I can easily pick up 40, 50, 60 Wi-Fi use in what, less than an hour, easy. Just bring it home, take off all the PCAPs onto my computer and crack them and there you go. It's all the PCAPs. So moving on to RFID. Um, RFID hacking is uh, a little bit of a delicate subject. It's a, a more more advanced, if you may, um, but it is something that uh, is used commonly on, on whenever we're, we're pen testing or, or physical pen testing onto a building. So I'll be talking about uh, the tools that are used, which is uh, RFID frequency diagnostic cards, uh, the Proxmark, the KC RFID duplicator, and the RFID ESP. So for the RFID pen testing and diagnosis card, uh, these you can actually pick up, uh, for example, I actually have both. I have the one from, from Dangerous Things, uh, which is uh, this one, white and black, it easily fits into your wallet. You can literally carry it everywhere. It doesn't, have, it doesn't need a battery or anything. And then there's uh, this one on the right-hand side corner, uh, which is from Hacker Warehouse. This one I actually carry as a keychain. So the cool, the thing about these two devices is that, for example, whenever you walk up to a building and you see that in order to get into the building you need an RFID card, you just take one of these two devices and put it next to the device and it will let you know if the RFID being utilized is actually low frequency or high frequency. So, you wonder why would someone need to know? Okay? Well, for example, if you're actually going using the Proxmark, 
in order to to clone a device, you you got to do some reconnaissance beforehand, and you must know if they're using low frequency or high frequency uh, in order to get into the building. If that's the, the, the method that they that they're currently using with our RFID cards. So the Proxmark. Uh, Proxmark is a widely known product in order for for what, uh, RFID uh, pen testing and RFID cloning as well. Um, the online community, it's still relatively small, but it is actively growing. Um, the, one of the cool uh, uh, features of the Proxmark 3, this is the RDB4, uh, the one that I use is the RDB4, um, is that you can actually synchronize it with your Bluetooth on your phone and uh, use tools, for example, you can use an RFID tool by the RFID research group and uh, also Project Walrus. So with these tools, um, for example, let's say you're in a, a red team and it's, uh, yeah, you have someone helping you out. Um, you can be looking at your phone while having the device synchronized with, uh, with your phone. And then that person helping you out can walk up to someone uh, close by and then try to clone the device and you, uh, you can let them know if they actually successfully cloned it or not. Um, in comparison to the uh, to the Proxmark versus other RFIDs, the advantage of the Proxmark is that you can actually get slightly about, I've successfully tested about two inches uh, of margin space of how close you actually need to, to be to the RFID in order to clone it. Um, other devices, you literally have to be in physical contact in order to clone. Uh, Proxmark is a little bit expensive. Um, currently, a hacker warehouse it goes for 320. And uh, that's without the Bluetooth module and the battery you can actually set up for it, so you can go completely wireless. Um, if you add those two modules, it's going to come up to about 400 or something. But it's a, it's a fantastic tool to have if you're if you're doing RFID pen testing. So another tool that I carry with me all the time, I literally carry it with my with my car keys and everything, is a KC RFID duplicator. Um, this is literally that I've done research. It's one of the cheapest RFID cloning devices that you can actually find. Uh, currently, I just saw it two days ago on, on Amazon, available for $40. It's super, super, super easy to use. Like, literally, you just hold down one of the buttons, put it close to the car that you're actually trying to clone, and within a couple of seconds, you're going to have the car clone. Um, as I mentioned, you can carry it on occasion. That's a car I carry with me all the time, wherever I go to. Um, this actually has the ability to store multiple cards. For example, this one right here, you can actually clone one card to, to this device that comes with it. And then you can store four more on each one of these buttons. The, one of the disadvantages of this device is that it's only available for low frequency. But if you think about it, it's not really that much of a disadvantage to the fact that a lot of companies, a lot of businesses out there, most of them, they actually use low frequency for the RFID. So this one does require direct content to, to, to being cloned. Now you may wonder like why Amazon is, is selling this kind of tool. They actually promote it not exactly as an RFID fantasy device, but they they uh, promote it as a device. For example, if you have um, your your gate to go into your community or the gates to go into or the, the door for the garage and why not you can actually clone all those uh, cards and just carry one without having to, prep to carry multiple cards. So that's how they promote it. So uh, moving on for the final device under our friendly fan testing. This is, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I would actually consider, yes, one of the best tools for RFID uh, hacking, which is called the RFID ESP key. So it's an implant device, and uh, when you plug it in, you can literally be in and out in time. I've not said around 10 minutes, but it can easily take you a lot less than that. So this is the actual device. It's literally the size of a, of a stand. So how it works is that, for example, you walk to a building, and at the entry door of the building, you'll have the scanner for the RFID cards. So if you actually take apart that scanner, you can implant this by stripping the wires and literally leaving here the, and assembly everything. So you can actually intercept, record, and replay the, replay the credentials that, that you're actually uh, scanning from the wires. Uh, so no matter your record, it, literally gets its power from, from all the cables that you're actually going to be scraping and attaching to it. 
And the beauty of it is that it actually has wake-up uh, Wi-Fi capability. So you can actually set up the device as a hidden access point. So whenever you, you can actually leave the device, go home, come back, I don't know, a week later, and then connect to it to the, through the hidden access point device, and then you can bring down all the uh, or download all the credentials that you that you actually stored on the device. And not only that, Simichin is even besides uh, downloading all the credentials that you stored, you can actually replay them and open the door instantaneously. Um, so that can uh, be acquired at Red Team Tools under ESPQ. So it's a fantastic tool. And the beauty of it is that due to the size and the nature, like once you install it, there's no way of, uh, almost no way of, of detecting it. Like, for example, if someone is actually monitoring traffic going through, they're not going to know that this device is actually there. It's, uh, it's a man in the middle. So uh, talking about the subject on the, on the implants, uh, let's move on to, to other devices. So by testing implants, this is, this is easily one of my, my favorite subjects uh, due to the nature of these being small toys, gadgets, whatever you want to call them. So starting off with uh, the Shard Jack. The Shard Jack is another small device that I carry with me as well with my keychains and other product, a fantastic product from Mac 5. Um, let's say you walk into a building where they have an, a, a lock reception, if you may. They have one of those VoIP uh, phones, voice over IP. Uh, you, and next to the VoIP phone, you have a, a jack outlet for Ethernet, right? Let's say they have an extra four, an extra port. You can literally plug in this device, let it run, and in less than two minutes, you can do a port scan of their network. So it's a great, fantastic tool for doing reconnaissance. So behind the actual device, it's, a, it's a, an embedded device. It actually has a Linux operating system running on it. So you can actually modify the scripts that, that you want. For example, if you want uh, certain syntaxes or, or tags on, on the NMAP uh, scan, you can actually set it up there. Um, the battery life on it, it runs for about seven minutes. I've, I've, I've been lucky sometimes that I can actually get it to run eight, maybe nine minutes, depending on what I'm actually doing with it. Um, another feature of it is that since it, when as soon as you plug it in, it will run as a DHCP. So we'll first wait until it actually has an IP address before doing the port scan. So once it has the IP address and it performs a port scan, you actually have the advantage is that it can synchronize and upload the, the port scan results to your uh, remote server, or you can actually store it locally, or you can actually do both. So it's a great tool. Like imagine going to a building, you plug it into a wall jack that you found, uh, do a port scan, two minute stops, then I'll upload the results to your to your remote server. So by the time that you're leaving the building, you already have an idea of other network requests. So yeah, great tool in my opinion. So another implant is the rubber doggy. Um, for physical pen testing, I'd say this is the most famous um, device for for pen testing. I mean, everybody's heard about it. Everybody has has copied it. It's one of the most commonly used USB tools for, for, for attacks. Um, there is a really, really large port on blogs and forums for the rubber ducky. Uh, dozens of, of payload scripts are already available on these. Literally have to copy and paste. Uh, a great one that, that I've seen being used with it is Mimikatz. For example, you can uh, have a rubber ducky with Mimikatz installed. And let's say you're walking around an office and that office has a, a computer that is uh, not locked out, but just locked. You can literally plug in the device with BB cats and, and it'll snatch your credits. And then after that, you can take it home and, and decode it. So another tool that uh, developers have created for it is the online decoder and encoder website. For example, if you're doing something custom or you want specific payloads and whatnot, you can actually go to ducktoolkit.com. And from there, you can actually craft exactly what you want to do. They have, I've seen payloads there all the way from, from firewall evasion to port scans to many different things. It all depends on what you want to do. Now, um, a lot of concerns about these is that, for example, one of the comments used is like going through a parking lot and dropping, off, uh, dropping 
close to an employee parking lot to see if someone picks it up and plugs it into their computer. Um, but you might be a little bit skeptic, as I am, of leaving a device that costs $50 behind, you know, in a parking lot, you know, a car might smash it or something, or nobody might pick it up, might be left in the dust in the rain, whatever it might damage. So I discovered an alternative option, which is the DT Spark. These I literally purchased on bulk uh, through through eBay. Um, you can get them for like two, three dollars each, and uh, you can actually uh, get the same results as the rubber ducky with the DT Spark. Um, it is a little bit more complicated, but at the same time, there's a lot of blogs and forums online that you can actually uh, reach out to and get support from there. And also similar to the Doug's Toolkit, I've discovered this uh, DigiSpark encoder compiler, uh, which is nixu-port.github.io. And it's a really cool web interface where you can actually uh, create your encodes uh, so that you can work for the DigiSpark. So uh, second device into the implants. Um, the LAN turtle, it's another product from, from High Five. Um, what I love, about this one is uh, the, the persistence. Like the other devices, usually you just plug in, one time use, that's it, you get your results or not. But this one, it's literally a shell. Like you're gonna be there actively 24 seven, whenever you want to. Like for example, here is a tweet from 2016 from, from Bo from Black Hills, um, that he was actually using the, the land turtle for, for a pentasting engagement. Like on the other hand, it's just a USB, and on this end, it's a RJ45 connection. So the beauty of it is that it is Linux-based, and as the as the other Hack5 products, you actually have uh, multiple modules, tools available to, to install. For example, there's a, a screenshot of a couple of the modules available. Um, and it also, as same as the other uh, devices, actually has the ability to, to upload the results to the command and control server, which uh, if you have, let's say, on a, on a digital ocean uh, VPS, um, you can have it literally available for you to 24-7. And anytime you plug it in, it'll do whatever it's going to be set to do and then upload the results. So this is uh, another device that actually came out in the in the market a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it is another product from from uh, the five group. Um, the this device I I recently acquired it. I haven't had yet the opportunity to play much with it. It is still under development. Uh, I five actually they they're currently doing weekly podcasts on on modules and payloads for it. Uh, kudos to them on the fantastic work they're doing. Um, so there are other keyloggers available uh, with similar features. Um, the reason why I picked this one versus the other one is the availability, uh, availability of this one actually as well, uh, being able to, to connect to a remote server and you can actually manage it remotely. Um, so it does have also a Wi-Fi antenna that it, it can actually connect to a, a Wi-Fi set that you actually have set up. And due to the size of it, it's, like, it's nearly undetectable. And not only that, this one actually has another feature versus the other key loggers. Is that this one can literally uh, scan the computer it's plugged into, and it'll pick up the the serial or the ID of all the devices on the computer, and it can actually emulate almost every every single one of the devices. So it's almost undetectable if you may. So uh, for the implants, the last one is uh, the Rogue Pi. Uh, this is also commonly known as a Dropbox. This is a fantastic, fantastic device. Um, if you set it up correctly, uh, due to the fact that it can give you remote access to your Wi-Fi hacking, your step one to uh, uh, hacking the Wi-Fi, then you can literally be on the network remotely. So I'm going to set up the Dropbox. Uh, you will need a Raspberry Pi. Uh, I personally use a Raspberry Pi 4 with Kali installed in it. Um, I would recommend uh, using as well a Wi-Fi pineapple for, for the Wi-Fi hacking, whatever you're going to work for, you're going to be dropping it off. Uh, a mobile hotspot device, um, you can actually use either a cell phone or one of those uh, hotspots that you can find, at, for example, uh, T-Mobile, Sprint, AT&T. 
Um, you can, uh, I would also strongly recommend using a high capacity power bank um, due to the fact that since you're going to have all these devices inside of a, a container, for example, a Pelican box, you can drop it off uh, somewhere. And uh, since you're going to be leaving it for X amount of hours, maybe days at a time, you want high capacity from that power bank. Um, so one example where you would use Dropbox. Let's say you're doing a physical time test into a building. And uh, in order to get to the building office, or let's say you're going to the third floor or the fourth floor, for example. And uh, you see that it might be challenging in order to get into the actual office, yet you might be able to hack into the Wi-Fi. And let's say that on the same floor, they have a publicly accessible restroom. You might be able to go into the restroom if they have one of those tiles you can actually lift up. You can take the, the Pelican box with all your devices inside and active. You pop it in onto the roof, close the ceiling, and guess what? Now you have remote access to the device. And then with remote access, you can take all your time in the world to hack your Wi Fi and then pop onto the network and continue from there. So, uh, in my experience for Galley and uh, hotspots, usually carriers, uh, they don't allow. Uh, for forwarding or routing uh, for the public and least for the hotspot devices. So I would recommend uh, having a, a VPN which allows port forwarding. I personally use PIA. Um, there's many solutions out there on VPNs. That's my subject I'm going to be talking to. Uh, but yeah, you would need a, a VPN with uh, port forwarding capabilities. So moving on to log picking and bypassing. Um, for lockpicking and bypassing, there's literally a lot of tools. Um, this is a, a list that I've compiled of the ones that I use the most. Um, there are others. This is not the complete list. Um, there's new tools, new locks coming up. So we're going to be talking about lockpicks, uh, door shims, door jam, padlock shims, cylinder shims, monkeys, um, etc., and the differences between each. So moving on, so lockpicks. If you actually have the chance of, of Googling and searching online, you will see there's a large, large, large variety of lockpicks. Um, my honest opinion is, is that if you've never lockpicked before, I would recommend getting one of those uh, cheap bundles that come off of eBay or Amazon, that they have like one of those transparent locks for you to practice and, and whatnot. But Ruth, if you're going to for the long run and you really want to invest into quality products, I would recommend, for example, from from Sparrow, from Southern, from Serape, uh, Red, the Red Team Tools. Uh, so I would recommend to invest into a quality product. Real quick on that one. Um, sign and, uh, and performance of lockpicks. Uh, you've probably seen that there's uh, different designs that they've done to them. For example, the, the ones that you can see on this picture are actually cut out. These are the ones that I use. Uh, the reason why I use these uh, versus the other ones is that these ones are very small and they're actually very thin. Uh, sometimes you might find uh, locks that you're actually, it's a little bit uh, hard to get into. So by having a thin device, you can actually smooth it in easier and you can have a better contact from the actual picks when you're doing individual picking. For example, the ones that come with, like, uh, covered with a rubber grip or a plastic grip. Yeah, I mean, those can be a lot more comfortable if you're, if you're taking a lot of time in, in order to pick a lock. But at the same time, I don't like them to the fact that they don't provide you enough feedback that, that I do, that, that I can get with, that I can get achieve with these. So on this picture, I actually have, this is the, the, the set of lock picks that, that I use. This is from Sparrow. Uh, this is called the dark shift. Um, this is from Sarah's also. This is called the Octo Octorake. It's a fantastic rake for raking. It's a, another technique for lock picking. And these are the Bogotas. These I got from Serape. These are actually made in titanium and from titanium. Now, uh, I have to give props and kudos to, to the Bogotas because literally I'd say 70% of all locks and doors that I've come across with it, I've actually had to pick. These two can literally get the job done, and it's it's, it's a fantastic product. Um, these I carry with me. That I can fit them in a wallet. I can conceal them pretty much anywhere. Um, you can barely see in the picture, but I have actually a little spring from a pen that I took apart in order to attach them together so I don't lose them or anything. 
but a uh, fantastic set of, of picks. So for door shift, um, this uh, this is a, a tool that can be used on on doors that usually don't have the, the dead latch. The dead latch is a little bend that usually sits right behind here. Um, for example, these kind of this kind of latches you can usually see on storage rooms, janitor rooms, usually on doors already inside offices and buildings and whatnot. Um, so the door are actually made out of plastic. They can literally be manually crafted with plastic household items. Like for example, those uh, big uh, gallons of, of milk or juice, uh, once you're done with them, you can actually cut them out and you can actually cut a, a shape similar to this, which can help you do the, the, the shaping with this. So they're, uh, the, in the way to use them, it's pretty simple. It's kind of like the old credit card trick that you just take it out, slide it through the door, and uh, it's going to open the door with you for, for you without having to even pick the door or anything. So another thing to keep in mind is that, uh, for example, uh, these, as I'll show you on the, actually, right ahead and show you on the next slide. For example, on this latch, on this side of the door, you can actually see the latch. On some doors, for example, uh, this one you can actually push in, but if it's a door that that you're pulling, like for example, you have the, the you have doors that go inward and go outward. Chances are that on some doors you might not be able to to have visibility on the on the plate, on the strike plate of the of the actual uh, latch. So the advantage of using the plastic door shims is that you can actually slide still in beneath the, the door and actually be able to, to hit the latch. So moving on to the door gems. Um this is a common tool for for opening doors and whatnot. I actually have these two. I have this one which I carry with me on my, my wallet. And then this is a, a more high heel one whenever whenever I'm red teaming I need someone else to help me with the tools and we have multiple doors and whatnot. So uh, the disadvantage of this one versus the plastic one is that this one can only be used on doors on which you have a visible latch like this one. If the door has a seal and it it's covered, then you're not going to be able to use it. But at the same time, it's versatile, as in you can actually use it in a push-pull direction. For example, if the latch is facing inward or if the latch is facing outward, either way, as long as you have visibility, you can actually use this tool in order to open it. So uh, you can find these online in different sizes and whatnot. And surprisingly, these can ask, can also be crafted. For example, if uh, you, if you have an old credit card that is expired and why not, you can actually take the credit card, which is the same size as this, and cut out these shapes. And believe me, the credit card will actually work as well. Uh, also, just to let you guys know, I have mentioned a lot of parts from from Sparrows and Hang Five. Uh, however, they have not paid me for 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 the publicity or anything. I just give them uh, kudos for their fantastic products. And literally, one of the every single one of their devices is actually purchased with my own money. Just to let you guys know. So moving on to padlock shims. Uh, I was not aware of the existence of padlock shims until one time I actually saw a video of a lock picking lawyer on, on YouTube and I was amazed of how easy it is to open a lock with these devices. Like these are also available on Sparrows, you can pick it up pretty cheap, also on eBay, Amazon, they're literally everywhere. So they look like this, these are actually covered in rubber, um, the ones that I got from Sparrows are not, it all depends on not whichever you prefer. So how they work, it's pretty simple. You Pretty much just wrap it around the the hasp, like like shown here on this picture, and slide it down. So it's actually going to push this device back, and then after that, within a couple of seconds, you're going to have a lock open. So moving on to the other kinds of shams, which is which is a cylinder four shams. Uh, this is a great. Uh, tool in order to, to open up cylinders if, if they're actually a little bit loose. Uh, so for example, on image one, there's a, a regular lock with, without the key inside. You can see that the, the pins are completely unmatched. On image two, 
uh, it's just using a random key. Still, you can see that the, the, the pins do not are not matching. So on three, they're using the proper key. And from there, you can actually see that they're able to, to open the lock. You see every single pin is matching. However, how the core shim works is that you insert it above the core, hitting the first pin, and then you manually pick each pin. So you pick the first pin, you push the core a little bit deeper. You pick the second pin, you push the core even a little bit more deeper, the, the shim uh, into the core a little bit more deeper, and so on and so on until you get every single pin. Then out of the blue, you're going to be opening the lock easy peasy. So here is actually a sample video of uh, Bossian Bill um, that he actually does the core shims and also the, the door chips as well, the one previously showed. So uh, bump keys. Bump keys is another tool that I've used in order to, to get to, to those. Sometimes you'll find those doors that are just really, really, really hard to pick. A bump key is a, a great way of, of entering a door quick and easy. Um, so how it works is how it's displayed here on this GIF is that these uh, parts of the key actually strike the pins with force, making them all go up at the same time. So once they go up, you immediately twist the key, and with the, the force, it actually open up and hold the, the pins on top. The only disadvantage of using bump keys is that it can be really, really, really loud. Like for example, if you're trying to go early in the morning into a building and trying to be security, the, the discreet, maybe they have, I don't know, um, security guards walking around the building while you're trying to be in it. Uh, chances are that they're going to be uh, hearing you knocking hard on the keys while trying to, to, to bump them into the door. So yeah, that's pretty much the only disadvantage of them. Uh, besides that, it's a great, 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 great tool for, for pen testing. So uh, physical pen testing, uh, elevator keys. Um, yes, uh, they are available online. Uh, yes, I do have uh, elevator keys. Um, yes, they're even available on, on eBay. Um, however, due to the nature of that subject, it can be very complicated uh, and also dangerous. So I'm not going to be talking about it on this presentation. Um, I mean, what can I say about an elevator? You go up and down. And uh, if you're interested on more on elevator hacking, there's a great talk on uh, that Deviant Olin presented on YouTube. You can actually watch it there and uh, you can learn a, little, a lot more about uh, elevator hacking there. So uh, default keys. I've always questioned someone like, why would you bother block picking if you already have a key? So, a lot of companies um, manufacture products uh, such as automobiles, such as uh, intercom devices, such as filing cabinets. And they, a lot of companies actually use the same default keys for literally everything. So one of the tools that I carry with me is a, a set of default keys that are commonly used everywhere. For example, I actually got this one off of eBay. For example, you have the, the NPO key one, uh, the 222343. Um, you have the 1284. You have the, the A126. You have many known keys that are used, for example, for intercom systems, for filing cabinets, for server cabinets. Uh, for example, there's one that's being uh, the, the fifth one, for example, the 1284. Is actually the common for fleet cars. And on this set, you can actually even find a golf cart key. For example, if you're walking on, I don't know, the downtown the beach or something, you see a golf cart. You know, I'm not suggesting anything, but just don't do it on, on, on devices you're not authorized to. Now, a little a tip on the 1284. We all know it's a Crown Vic, as displayed here, but just in the FYI, the Crown Vic is not only a cat car. We all know the multiple uses that that, that car has been useful for. Um, but yeah, uh, here you can actually see a, a video of, of the 12A4 being used to, in order to open and even turn on the car. So, uh, 
So you would wonder why um, you would uh, use a default key for self for Instagram level. Let's say if you're fantasizing a, a data community or somewhere where they have a gate and Instagram system. Um, by using the default key to open the, the intercom, which is commonly used for actually servicing it, um, you have access to the full diagram and, and the, the panel, right? The beauty of it is that if you actually do some little Googling, some research and one into each panel and their manufacturer and whatnot, chances are you're going to find their manual. And what the manual, chances are you're going to find the cable specifications, such as uh, the unlock signal in order to unlock it. You know, it, these kind of things you find openly available literally everywhere. So key jigglers. Uh, key jigglers is uh, another fantastic tool uh, that I've used. This is commonly used for wafer locks, uh, tumble pins, and uh, other devices. Uh, for example, there's a lot of videos online of, of these used in order to open a lot of Ford cars, especially. Uh, I think one of the most common ones uh, being used are these three in the middle. Um, uh, one of them is actually called the one one key to rule them all. Um, but jigglers is a is a great tool to carry. For example, sometimes you find those uh, cabinet locks that they they're just completely unpickable. You just toss in the jiggler key, start jiggling, and, and the chances are within a couple of minutes you're actually going to be opening that lock. Um, here's another sample video of how Jigglers is being used. This one is actually used on a, on a vehicle. And uh, yeah, it's a great tool to have to your, to your add-on. All you have is that they're small and, and thin. You can literally carry them with your, with your regular piece wherever you go to. So another tool that I've used to be surprised is uh, the compressed air. So thanks to uh, fire, reg fire code regulations, uh, it depends on what I believe this applies for every single state. Um, whenever you have a building that has access control or RFIDs, in order to exit the building, they have the request to exit sensor. So if you notice, as soon as you're exiting the building, there's a device on top of the door that it's actually pointing in the direction of people walking towards the door. So when it senses uh, the thermal, uh, temperature of someone actually walking towards the door, they'll open the door, unlock the door, and allow you to exit. The issue or the, the vulnerability about these is that by using compressed air, you can simulate the, the change of temperature and actually unlock the door from the outside. But just literally, you flip the, the compressed air upside down with a nozzle, you, you press it through the door, and it'll spray the air into the inside. So the drastic change of temperature will actually let the request to access sensor that there's a change of temperature and it'll literally unlock the door for you. So there's a few sample videos here that I've added. Uh, one of them is actually done with compressed air. Um, uh, as you can see here, it can actually be done with the vape as well. And another option which uh, DVA did was with using whiskey. However, that one, if you're actually on a higher job, I wouldn't recommend doing it. Um, another uh, advice on these is that supposedly I've heard that you can actually take uh, a frozen piece of uh, newspaper or magazine and slide it into the door and supposedly that works as well. Um, personally, I have not tested it, but haven't been in the need to. Um, and there's a, another technique used. For example, sometimes in some offices, they will take the request to exit sensor and actually put it a few feet away from that from the door. So you might think, oh, okay, so the, and the compressed air might not work. Uh, a way of bypassing these is, is if you actually take, a, if you're able to, you take a balloon, you inflate it with air, and you pop the balloon through the, the like you put, you put the balloon through the hinge of the door, you blow it, and then you let it go from the other side, and with movements of the, air, of the balloon flying in the air, it might unlock the, the, the request to access sensor as well. So two other tools that I use for my for my pen testing. Uh, one is a UDT, the other one is a DDT. So these are called the underdoor tool and the double door tool. The double door tool. So for example, sometimes you'll find that this is commonly found in, uh, for example, in schools and uh, uh, big buildings would have a, a lot of employees and one that they need the ability for fire codes in order to, to open both doors at the same time. So for example, here's a picture of the double door tool being used. Like you literally just, if the, if the door is not installed correctly and it doesn't have the, the hinge in order to protect it in the middle, 
you just pop this tool in between and you can just pull this and within seconds you're going to be opening that door. So another fantastic tool is uh, the under the door tool. Uh, for this one, uh, yeah, it, yeah, there's a sample video on how to use it uh, thanks to, to prior code regulations as well. Um, office doors are not re uh, are required to have a handle instead of a knob. So due to the fire code regulation and then having the, the handle on it, uh, by law, uh, they have to have it. So this is a fantastic tool for opening up the, the, the handles on doors. The only disadvantage of, of these tools is that they can be, due to the fact that they're made out of metal, they can be a little bit big and they're a little bit hard to, to conceal. Um, but as a matter of fact, they're great fantastic tools. So other physical pen testing tools that I would recommend carrying with you or, or using uh, a drone for surveillance space. Um, personally, I, I actually have a, a, a DGI. Uh, those can be a little bit expensive, but I use it for as a hobby, flying drone, and also taking pictures whenever I'm going to the site and I need a, a physical picture of the, of the layout of the building. And let's say, for example, I can see that the, the back side of the building with Google Maps. I just pop up the drone and I can take pictures of the back, see wherever they have um, cameras and where they have doors. I might be able to bring up to a second, third floor of a building, see if there's someone inside and that kind of thing. Uh, another tool you might want to use is a flashlight. That's always good to carry. Um, I would also recommend using a multi-tool pliers. Uh, for example, in my experience of uh, Let's say you're on an engagement and you're trying to open up a door, but you forgot your lock picks, you know, and it turns out you're carrying with you the multi tool pliers and you have a can of soda. With the can of soda, you can actually, I'm sorry, you not forget the, the lock pick tools, but you forgot your portions. With the can of soda and the multi tool pliers, you can actually cut out the shape of the portions and literally just make it on the spot. Um, a radio, if you're a red team, yeah, that's very important. You have to have communication with your team if they need to report something. Um, I would also advise you to carry with you water and snacks. You know, sometimes you're, you're picking a door, it can take an hour or two, maybe if it's a complicated door or a building or whatever. And uh, chances are you're not going to find any water or snacks. So you want to carry something with you. Um, in regards to previous slides, I mentioned of, ha of having a fake badge for, for the social engineering. However, in this case, I do also strongly recommend carrying with you proper identification, uh, just in case, uh, God forbid, you're, you're, you're caught and they call a law enforcement and whatnot, you will need to present yourself and what you're doing and whatnot. Um, hand sanitizer is definitely a must, especially nowadays with the whole coronavirus pandemic going on. And uh, sometimes you'll open up a door and you're successfully going to an office and whatnot, and they have desks in there. And some employees are just not clean enough, and you'll see that their desk is a complete mess. And it's just, I'm sorry to say this, this is utterly disgusting. So you want to carry with your hands on the fact just to, you know, clean your hands and whatnot if you're not able to wash your hands in a, in a close by a restaurant. So with you, you also want to carry a camera. Uh, to take all pictures and videos of every uh, step of the, of the process of the pen test engagement in order for you to, to find your report and present it, present it to your client or whoever's hiring you. Uh, another tool to use is binoculars if you're doing a physical reconnaissance. For example, if you're parked in the parking lot, whatever, from a, across the street of a building, you want to see who's there and whatnot, keep track of who's going in and out of the building. And finally, obviously, uh, a laptop, like you will always need to, to carry a laptop with you, let's say, for example, when your tools is not working for whatever reason, you need to diagnose your tool or troubleshoot it, it's a great way uh, to troubleshoot it as well. For example, if you're able to physically gain access onto the, to, to the building, then uh, part of the target is that you are allowed to connect to the network, that you can actually bring your laptop and pop into the network and then continue hacking from there. So uh, a lot of people actually ask me, so what would uh, keep me out of a, of a building? Well, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. There's a lot of challenges out there, a lot of systems implemented, um, but you just never know. 
So there's always a way of, of breaking something here. So um, here's a couple of the pages from where I acquired all the tools that I currently use. Um, also a couple of videos and channels. So for example, Deviant Olam on YouTube, there's Lock Picky Lawyer, Bossy on Bill, and others. Um, those are great resources for, for learning on, on lock picking and physical contesting. Um, so besides that, um, I do thank you for, for giving the time to do the presentation. I hope you liked it. And uh, once again, this was David Berinsky. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you. I got a few. Uh, some things I've noticed that I just kind of oh, want to point out and throw out there for a cheap location for getting lock picks. Don't overlook wish.com. Uh, so I got all my coworkers last year for Christmas, a, a very simple lock picking set yeah. from wish.com. And it was like two bucks a set. It was literally nothing. It wasn't the greatest set in the world, but very great for someone that was just starting off. Uh, the other second thing I noticed with regard to flashlight uh, recommendation, always use an LED flashlight, never use an incandescent flashlight. And the reason for that is because a lot of your company's uh, older security camera systems will not be able to see an LED flashlight. So anything that you're shining around is not going to illuminate on the camera. Just wow. throwing that out there. And of course, lastly, always make sure that you have your get out of jail free paper that's signed by the company and it defines what the scope of your pen test is. So especially like right now with looting and all that crap going on, you can hand that off real quick and not get beat down or shot. Anyways, yep. that's my two cents. All right. Um, I know, thank you very much, Dave. I know that you were answering questions in the chat. However, I wanted to give everybody an opportunity if you want to uh, put something in chat or if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question or make a comment, uh, you can do that now. We'll give everybody a chance to do that. All right. Well, I think Dave answered almost all the questions in chat anyway. So, uh, so I just wanted to, I mean, it was a, a live demo presentation. Just wanted to do a, a, a live display. Um, this is a Proxmark. Um, so it actually is on and wired and synchronized to my phone. So right now it is scanning completely wirelessly. This is a diagnostics card, which would show you if it's scanning um, high frequency or low frequency. So just by bringing it together, it'll actually indicate immediately. So that's a sample of both tools there. So, oh, wow. So yeah. Something else too for that, I was taking a look at, uh, consider instead of a, a regular clipboard, what we call the posi box. So it's the big, it's the big thick plastic clipboards that have space inside it where you could easily hide electronic equipment that can actually pick up on all that stuff. Yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of people do that. And of course myself, anywhere I go, if I'm gonna be going into like a telco closet, I always make sure I have a hard hat and always make sure I'm wearing a reflective vest. Oh yeah, and uniforms, you can actually just go to, to a local thrift shop and pick up pretty much anything oh, sure. you want for like $5. You no, know, UPS, FedEx, yeah, you $1.99. <laughs> All right, guys, any other comments? Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dave. That was uh, amazing. And uh, we have that recorded, and we also have uh, the recording itself and the slide deck, so we'll be able to supply those uh, upon demand. And it looks like, uh, Henry, um, are you up? Yep, right here. Oh, fantastic. Let me see if I can do this. I am making PC the presenter, right? Yes. I just want to make sure. Okay, so um, you, I'm going to let you introduce yourself because uh, you guys seem to be better at that than I am. So let me go ahead and make you the presenter. And you should be able to select which monitor you want to share. Perfect. All right, it's all yours. Thanks, babe. Awesome, thank you. Uh, my name is Henry. I also do uh, pen testing and red teaming. And one of the things that I wanted to do today is give you a little bit of an introduction into red teaming, uh, clarifying a couple of uh, things that I found myself uh, facing along the way, namely uh, people not really understanding the, the difference between uh, pen test and uh, red team engagement. And also, we're going to focus a lot on, on the examples of what those differences translate into. 
In other words, um, there are a couple of things that you might do on a pen test that you might not do on a red team engagement and vice versa. Ideally, after this talk, you'll be able to identify some of those uh, differences. So like I said, what we'll cover, um, quick intro comparison with penetration testing, and then we're gonna deep dive into examples. In particular, we're gonna talk about IP and domain reputation when developing a spear phishing campaign for your red team engagement. And if you were on my last talk, uh, we gave an introduction about Mimikatz. This time, I'm gonna continue a little bit of that talk, uh, focusing on bypass techniques that you might need in order to move around in an environment that is heavily protected compared to maybe just uh, a rather simple network. And later on, we're, by the end, I'm gonna give you uh, some extra resources. You're gonna see a bunch of links uh, throughout the presentation, but I'm gonna provide a few extra ones at the end, along with a couple of books that I feel summarize very well um, everything that you need to know to understand that uh, the red team, the red team engagement or red teaming compared to uh, other types of uh, offensive engagements. So for our quick intro, um, I wanted to make a little bit of a difference. Uh, it's very common for people to talk about a red team when they actually refer to the ethical hackers, penetration testers, and basically everyone on the offensive side of cybersecurity, which is slightly different than the engagement itself, which is normally called red teaming or red team engagement. Uh, the difference, honestly, it's a lot about just simplicity, and speed, efficiency. Um, as you can see on, on the right, we're gonna talk about creating domains, we're gonna talk about doing a lot of stuff, but it's not uncommon for a pen test to just request uh, to be whitelisted, to generate exceptions, because pen tests, a lot of times, you're dealing with clients who want to do a lot of things within just one week. So maybe you won't be able to create a lot of domains, give them time to gain reputation and all of that. A lot of times you'll just ask, hey, can we be whitelisted? in order to be quick, efficient, and to the point versus where if you are on a red team engagement, you're probably gonna want something that is low, comprehensive, and well simulated um, in regards to how a real attacker would uh, perform it. Now, having said that, one is not necessarily better than the other. Like I said, you might be dealing with a client that doesn't have uh, the amount of money to invest for an engagement that is longer than a week. Um, even worse, maybe you're dealing with a client that recently started caring about cybersecurity. Uh, a red team, a full red team engagement is not going to give them anything useful versus just a really quick vulnerability assessment or a well targeted pen test. So let's talk about a, a particular example for that. And if let's say that you're preparing a spear phishing campaign. If you are doing so, like we said before, for a pen test, maybe just ask to get whitelisted, send the emails, see who clicks, and then you have a valuable metric to provide to the client. Hey, this is the amount of people within your firm that click. But for a red team engagement that it can span even months, you might need to take certain steps because you want to fully simulate what an attacker would do. So one of the common things that I've seen, and actually a couple of people don't know, you can use services to carry your uh, spear phishing campaigns. But normally what they do is just they add a tag or a header, like within the email header, that is gonna say X fish test. Now I mentioned that for two reasons. I've heard of people who didn't actually know that that was there. Uh, again, for a pen test, that's great. Uh, it might actually help you to get whitelisted and get through with the test, but for a, in a real case scenario, that shouldn't be in there. So you're probably gonna end up doing a lot of custom things instead of just using um, a Pentest, uh, sorry, a spear phishing service, let's say uh, no before, or phishing box or that kind. You're probably gonna end up doing your own thing, not only in 
the email sending itself, but everything related to it, that is uh, getting a domain and making sure that they have everything that's necessary so it's not gonna look like spam, but rather like a legitimate uh, domain, having SPF, DKIM, all of those elements. And if it's pointing to a website in which you want to serve malware in order to infect the target, one of the things that you need to consider is there might be crawlers, there might be scrapers that are going around on the internet and if they see your website with malware, they're gonna flag it, they're gonna blacklist it or something similar. So in order to solve that and increase impact, uh, you're gonna dedicate some time into um, making sure that what you serve to who's connecting to you, is gonna be different depending on whether it's a crawler, if it's actually one of your targets, and also try not to use off the shelf exploits, but rather develop your own. And we're gonna talk about that uh, in a bit. So in particular for IP reputation, then we're gonna talk about domain reputation. One of the things that I noted, avoid free VPNs like the plague, they are all already flagged. In fact, you can get paid services with several different servers all over the world and they're already gonna be flagged and on a vast majority of them. I've had good results with uh, PIA, private internet access. They don't have as many, but sometimes they're flagged, sometimes they're not. Uh, NordVPN, for example, it has thousands and almost all of them are already flagged. So ideally what you wanna do is just create your own way of sending those emails. But if you feel like that's too much work, you can actually use a high reputation sender like MailChimp or SendGrid. I've heard good things about Mail250 and Swagmail, but personally I haven't tried them. But I've had success with both uh, MailChimp and SendGrid. Um, regarding the domain reputation, um, the age of the domain is something that is important. And that's one of the reasons why for example, it's not really feasible for a pen test if it's just gonna last a week, you won't be able to actually increase that age in any meaningful way. It will always be from the moment that you sign the engagement letter, you might say, okay, we're done. I'm gonna start with this right away and I'm doing the pen test next week. It's still gonna be just a two week old uh, domain. For a red team engagement, you probably will be able to buy that domain very early on then continue with other parts of the open source intelligence, social engineering, intelligence gathering, whatever else you're doing prior to that attack. And you'll have enough time that the domain will at least be um, a month old or something like that. So it doesn't look like fresh new that was just created for this in particular. Um, SSL certificates from a certificate authority instead of self-signed certificates. Uh, and setting up DMARC, DKIM, and SPF, which basically, if you know what those are, if you don't know what those are, it's basically telling the server that receives the email who's allowed to send emails uh, on your behalf, like in terms of a uh, server, um, a signature, and just a bunch of rules on, on what to do and how to read those uh, uh, verifications, if you will. And going back a little bit to uh, MailChimp and MailChimp and SendGrid, if you're setting all of the uh, all of this on your own, make sure that you also verify your domain with these providers, so that when you send that email, it says that it was sent by you instead of hey, it was sent by MailChimp on behalf of your domain. Uh, in order to continue um, with domain reputation, we mentioned. Um, trying not to get flagged, trying to avoid getting blacklisted and serving different uh, content according to who's connecting. There's different ways to do that, but the most common one is, use, is with the user agent. Now, you should know that you could connect to a website with whatever user agent you want. So you could have a scraper connecting to your server and not identifying itself as a crawler, as a scraper or something like that, but probably is gonna use the user agent of Chrome or something like that. One of the common techniques to try to detect that is using JavaScript, which basically means setting up a script 
making sure that whoever is connecting to uh, your server will run that script and that script will do a couple of checks within the environment in order to determine, yeah, this guy is a bot or this guy is a legitimate user. I'm gonna change what I'm serving to this user. And if you just wanna see a bunch of uh, user agents for different crawlers, right there you can use that command. It will download from gray noise whatever updated list they have of uh, web crawlers and their user agents. Just slap that into your server, make sure that you don't give them anything suspicious. Add the JavaScript, try to analyze a little bit more, and then you uh, serve different content according to these different uh, clients that will be connecting. Uh, some final uh, recommendations or considerations. The email volume, this is kind of obvious, but if the email is huge, there's a lot of HTML code in it, and you're sending emails like crazy, you're still gonna get flagged. Ideally, you need to try to keep it precise, try to send a couple of emails, then wait a little bit and send a couple of emails. So maybe short burst with decent pauses in between uh, will go a long way. Avoid broken links and try to avoid redirects. I, I've seen some services um, or security solutions flagging redirects when the domain that you, your domain is redirecting, let's say to Google, Facebook, something like that, to a high reputation domain, but you are not related to them. So this is normally used when, let's say you're trying to capture credentials and then uh, forwarding that to another domain versus just grabbing and throwing, doing uh, a permanent redirect or that kind of stuff. You, you got to be careful with those details in order to, to make the campaign not only um, realistic in terms of how the attacker would do it, but also try not to alert a bunch of security tools in the meantime doing like funky stuff. So try to keep it simple while emulating all of that. Um, now let's move into the longer portion of the of a presentation. As I said, on the last presentation, I was talking about uh, Mimikatz, which is a great tool. Uh, you can use it to get credentials from a device and then reuse those credentials however you deem necessary. But one of the things that, we, that I mentioned at the end of that talk was that because it's such a powerful tool, a lot of anti-malware solutions are looking for it. So ideally, you'll have to find a way to hide it. So we're gonna talk about uh, obfuscation, encoding, uh, packing. Uh, I know that there's a bunch of tools that probably people are very aware about, but I wanted to mention a couple of new ones. I particularly tested Powerline, it worked great. And then we're gonna move on to uh, app whitelisting bypass. Uh, there's a nifty technique in which you use a garbage collector and a path traversal in order to run other stuff while being whitelisted. Um, then we're going to talk about AMSI, which is the anti-malware scan interface for Windows, and Credential Guard, which is pretty self-explanatory, trying to prevent stuff like Mimikatz stealing credentials. And last but not least, we're going to talk about kernel drivers, because why not? If you're already in the uh, in the device itself, why stay in user space when you can move to kernel kingdom? So let's start with uh, obfuscation, encoding, and packing. Personally, I'm surprised that you can use XOR encoding, uh, Shikata Ganai from uh, the Metasploit framework, or even just keyword replacement. And in some cases, that will still work. So not so long ago. Uh, in 2016, uh, the guys from Black Hill InfoSec basically grabbed Mimikatz, throw it into Virus Total, and already, without doing anything, only 19 out of the 50 something uh, engines actually found or identified Mimikatz as a threat. And one of the, the very first thing that they did is just replace the word cats with dogs and that number that 
the 19 uh, positive identifications for malware dropped to only eight. So now a, a quick mention on that. I've seen that still work, but it's a huge difference on where it is working. It says a lot about the maturity of a company, their stance on cybersecurity, whether you can bypass with rather simple and well-known and documented techniques that have been out there for years, or if you'll need to uh, kick it up a notch and try to make things a little bit more complicated like we're about to see. Normally, that usually correlates to um, compliance. So if you have uh, banks dealing with credit cards, they have to comply with PCI. If you have hospitals with uh, patient uh, health information, they have to comply with HIPAA. Versus, let's say you have a really successful startup that doesn't really deal with uh, credit card information or patient information, but they still have a lot of uh, personally identifiable information yet there's very little regulations that relate to them directly. So those are the kind of companies that you're gonna see maybe don't have really advanced security. Maybe all techniques like this one will work, but at least other bigger, more mature companies are picking up on this and trying to find solutions for it. So that's why I moved onward to more complex techniques and one of the things that I found recently, it was honestly super simple. It's, and I love the title of the, of the article they wrote, bring your own garbage collector. So basically you bypass application whitelisting with a net core open source software framework and a very simple path traversal. I left you over there the link that you can see in a rather simple way, how you can use this to run other stuff while having your app, let's say, whitelisted. But personally, I love PowerLine a lot more because as you can see there, you can run PowerShell without using PowerShell. It's actually C Sharp. And one of the great things about it is, as I mentioned a little bit ago, so you can use different packing, encoding, and obfuscation met methods that have been out for a while, like Shikaraganai within the Metasploit framework. But this one is a fairly new one that I catch not so long ago, and I've had nothing but success with it. In particular, I tested it for a client, so I couldn't actually take screenshots. So these screenshots are for from the uh, source that you see down there. Running it standalone is gonna get caught whether it is downloaded to a file and trying to run or even trying to run a memory is going to get cut. But if you drop in within PowerLine, all of these elements, you can actually put Mimikatz inside, drop credentials, and even if they're blocking a PowerShell, this is still going to work because, like I said, it's not actually running PowerShell. It's C Sharp, but the, uh, they implemented pretty much the same calls, very similar methods. So it's a great way of hiding your payloads without getting caught um, by any of the very simple uh, security solutions that you might have. Even some of the complex ones have been able uh, to bypass just using PowerLine. As for the anti-malware scan and credential guard that are present on Windows, they're a bunch of bypass techniques so but they still keep going back to hey i'm gonna grab the keywords from the script throw it into windows defender and make sure that if windows defender says this script it's gonna block it well one guy just x or the whole script for bypassing amsi and that's it it was no longer detected um if your user the user that you are attacking is an admin there's pretty much nothing to worry about. You'll be able to just move forward. If they are not an admin, well, I'll let you a link of a bunch of different AMSI bypass that actually do work with PowerShell. So using that and PowerLine will basically allow you to bypass a bunch of different uh, detection methods.
But personally, one of the most powerful tools that I've seen is Mimikatz on its own already has a kernel driver, which is called Mimidrive or Mimidrv. This allows you to move from user space to kernel space, which gives you more Windows functionalities. You can modify running processes under attributes, and you are now able to interact directly with other loaded drivers instead of having to use something in between. To start it, super easy, exclamation point, plus sign, and as you can see on the screenshot, it's going to look for it. It's, it's going to see if it's present. It's going to see if it's registered. It's going to give uh, permission to everyone. And that's it. Now, do remember to clean it up afterwards. We're talking about a kernel driver that is going to be added there. Um, it should go without saying during your engagement. You should always do proper cleanup at the end which is, again, one of the reasons why you are going to see a little bit of a difference between a pen test uh, and a red team engagement. You're probably going to spend a lot of time catering and, and nurturing your exploit to make it something beautiful, super complex, that is going to grab a bunch of different things. Well, it probably has the potential to either uh, generate a lot of destruction or simply leaving a bunch of open holes that you're you'll definitely need to close. So going back to this, whatever these techniques that you're looking at and trying to implement, try to go through the source code, try to understand what they are actually doing, how they're doing it, and how you'll manage to revert anything that they open up or modify. So more references and sources. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to leave at the top of the list, uh, there's a really small book called Red Team Development and Operations. Uh, it comes with a companion website. You can actually go to the website right now. There's already a bunch of information there. Personally, I prefer something to for uh, having like a small book to carry around and be able to read every once in a while. That one and the next one, which is uh, Tribe of Hackers Red Team. That one is basically just a collection of uh, interviews with 47 professionals in the field, but they talk a lot about uh, understanding the difference between uh, Red Team and pen testing. There's uh, an incredible amount of recommendations regarding uh, rules of engagement, how to properly deal with uh, all, of those, all, all of those elements. Uh, we saw, I saw a little ago in the chat when Dave was talking that people were asking, hey, what happens if you get caught? Well, uh, very important to have a signed uh, letter, uh, a signed engagement letter in order to, like Matt said, that, that's your uh, get out of jail free card. I've actually, one of the things that I've done is actually create a fake one and a real one and try to present the fake one first. And if that one goes through, then I have yet another thing to mention on the report that failed. Um, but yeah, definitely having all of this organized in a good way, it's going to help you a lot. And those two books um, go into great detail on how to go about doing that. And there, there's a bunch of uh, GitHub links in which I normally take uh, ideas. They're sharing like different techniques. Sometimes they recommend tools. A lot of the information that you're going to need is going to be just there in terms of uh, tactics, techniques, and, pro and procedures. Um, there's a whole line of um, the first the GitHub link says awesome red teaming. So you can look for awesome thread intelligence, awesome blue teaming. There's a bunch of, there's like a whole mini series of of these guys collecting a bunch of information um, condensed into one of the, the areas of cybersecurity, be it offensive side, defensive side, or just research. There's a lot of information to be taken from that one, but I did leave a couple of others that I think have really good uh, analysis on certain tools or recommending, like I said, tactics, techniques, and procedures. And 
all in all a bunch of uh, techniques and tools that you can download, tailor to your own effects, and then launch them however you deem necessary. Uh, I'm gonna wrap it up because I know that we don't have that much time left. So I'm gonna jump straight into uh, Q and A and answering questions if anybody has any. Henry, you can have all the time you want here. That was really, really good. Thank you. Um, anybody that wants to ask some questions, I know some people had asked in chat, but you are welcome to unmute yourself and ask your question as well. We encourage discussion and questions. All right. Um, I had a question. Where'd it go? Yep, sorry, completely gone. Um, Dave, did you have, I thought you had a question for Henry. Was there something in there you had a question on? Um, not really. I mean, uh, uh, red team is kind of part of what I do. It's not like covering something completely different. So it's, it's a okay. subject that I'm actually familiar with. Okay. You know, I found it interesting that uh, you said that you uh, make a fake engagement letter, um, fake get out of uh, get out of jail free card. Um, I didn't think about that. That's interesting. It's yeah. My actually, advice, uh, sorry for interrupting. My advice would be careful with social engineering and social engineering a law enforcement officer because that could get you a whole another level of trouble. I oh, yeah. Agree. Actually, talking yeah. about that. Um, I've had both of those experiences actually happen to me. In one case, I was caught by the security guard. That's when I used the fake engagement letter because the security guard was employed by my client, so was within the scope. Law enforcement, unless you're getting hired directly by law enforcement, law enforcement is never on your scope and you always have to be completely honest with them. Do not ever try to get them the fake engagement letter, go straight with the real one. Yeah, that's definitely, I've had both, uh, both situations happen to me. And I think I saw in, in one of the comments, uh, I don't know if, if it was you, Dave, that mentioned it, that guards tend to be trigger happy if they're armed. In my case, they weren't armed, but yeah, they were a lot more aggressive than when the police came up. Like actually the police were, I would say they were like fascinated about what I was doing. They would, they were happy to get my engagement letter, uh, call the client number that was in there, verify the information. They were great. Uh, it was actually the, the bad experience that I had was actually with the security guards. The yeah, problem I would have from the defensive posture is it honestly, I'm a, again, I'm a former military police officer and I've had worked with LAPD and San Diego PD. If I rolled up on a scene and I was suddenly given two different letters, I would seriously call to question the validity of the actual correct letter. You know, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, that's definitely something to consider. Uh, in my case, those two uh, scenarios occurred in different situations. So, yeah, I didn't have to deal with uh, the security guard telling one thing to the officer and me telling him another. That likely didn't happen, and and I get what you're saying. That could end up uh, giving more issues than actually solutions. So it's definitely something sure. to consider. But that being said, there's also a lot of bored, stupid security guards that just don't even know what they're doing. Um, I actually remember one time I was doing a, a red team uh, demonstration for a telco company I was working for. And I actually had the security guard help me carry a computer all the way out to my car. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, that's by far the, the, the most common uh, kind of scenarios. Uh, but my only two bad experiences were the ones that I just mentioned. Everything else has been uh, great. I know that in the uh, both in the comments and, and in the previous questions, they were talking, for example, about uh, using a high visibility vest and a hard hat. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. amazing how much just that is going to help you uh, get across the door, get access to somewhere uh, you're not Absolutely. supposed to be, or even better, just people avoiding bothering you because they think, okay, he's busy, he's doing something important, I'm not going to bother him. 
So all of that is uh, within the field uh, of possibilities when using just a high visibility vest and a hard hat. Yep. And also make sure if you're, uh, one of the other things I used to make sure I did was if I used a, uh, a an ID card of some kind that had picture on it, I always made sure the picture was a little bit ambiguous, something a little bit different about me, made it harder to actually tell who I was and make sure I didn't carry an actual real correct ID because some places I've gone to when I did a test, it's like you show them the, your, your corporate badge and then they ask you for your driver's license instead so they can make a photocopy of it and you're like, uh, and the names don't match. So I'd say something like, <laughs> I left it out in the car, I'll be right back and then phew, gone. <laughs> now, um, those, those badge makers, they, they can be a, a little bit pricey. I mean, the cheapest one I've seen online, you can find it for like, the lowest I've seen is probably around seven hundred dollars, so they can be a little bit expensive. But are they worth it? Oh yeah, Staples absolutely. Staples and Office Depot. Uh, Staples and Office Depot. They actually, if you go online, you can actually find them online. They make um, bubble jet ID card makers, and it's right. just sheets of the plastic with a, a laminate that you run through your bubble jet printer, puts the fake ID on there, and then you like a piece of tape, you put it on top of the plastic, looks like a regular ID card. Gotcha. Yeah, I'd, I'd rather stick to the overnights where I don't have any interaction with people. It's just a lot easier. Understood. So I have a question for Henry. So regarding the whole uh, red teaming and, and, and also uh, physical as well, do you think they're, they're increasing a lot more with having everybody working remote and whatnot? So actually i would say two things about that uh lately work has been crazy and i feel like one of the reasons is because precisely because everybody's working remotely uh but all of that like you said all of that is really focused on online interactions rather than uh physical pen testing i i don't know if, if that was a preference of my clients i was actually doing physical pen tests for a couple of them and they said, hey, because of the whole coronavirus thing, we're basically closing up the office. Everything is, uh, everyone's working remotely. And I said, okay, I understand that uh, why you're doing that makes perfect sense, but you're asking me not to go to test uh, physically now that there's a lot less people that can catch me. But exactly. yeah, that's the way they prefer to do it. And personally, I think that it's, it's a mixed bag. It, it will definitely depend on, on on that particular building and the way it is set up. Um, because on one end, like I said, there's le less people that will be able to see me if I'm doing something funky. But at the same time, the probably few security guards that are gonna be present are expecting to see absolutely no one. So at the same time, it might actually be harder. I guess it all depends on on the building itself, how it is set up, how security is set up, and and those kind of things. Gotcha. One of the big problems they have right now with everybody working from home also is that now you are opening yourself up to a plethora of potential attack vectors. Because if one of your employees has an exposed or compromised computer on their home network, and they suddenly connect their home network to their work network via VPN, I can see a lot of bad shit happening in the very near future with stuff like this. Well, yeah, not, that's... Only that, not only that, you can consider the, 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 the in a way, privilege escalation because now since let's say you have a whole company working from home. So instead of attacking the low level privilege employees, you can just go directly and try to hack into the CEO of the company, which, uh, which is actually working from home. And chances are that the CEO of the company is going to have full access to the whole company. So instead of hacking all the other employees, just go directly to the, to the, to the CEO. Sure. And uh, did anybody else see the uh, the deep fake hack that was showed up in the news fairly recently? Um, a co company basically got deep fake hacked, not by picture, but by voice. They had managed to replicate the CEO's voice and contacted the CFO, authorizing a payment to go to some bank account. And they ended up getting a substantial amount of money before they everybody realized that it was a deep fake. amazing oh i saw a question from elias in the chat so what happens when you 
uh, trick, say the receptionist, and some higher up realizes that you're not sub supposed to be there, how do you recover from that? Or that's it, you just leave at that point. Uh, it could be either. You could end up leaving. Um, one of the reasons why we were talking about high disability vests, hard hats, and pen and paper, everything along those lines with the clipboard and everything else. Um, one of the cool things about using stuff like that is that neither the receptionist, not the C levels are going to understand what you're trying to do. And probably both are going to try to leave you alone. The receptionist is going to let you go into the back room and then the higher ups at most, they're going to complain that, uh, the internet is low and they want you to fix it. And that's it. At least that's what happened to me. Uh, okay. one yeah. time in which I was interrupted in the middle of the server room, like with my disability vest and everything else. And it was literally just to complain that the internet was low and if there's anything that I could do about it, and that was it. Uh, sure, but true. yeah, in certain cases, if it's yeah. not a C level, but it's actually within the IT team and knows that you're not supposed to be there, yeah, you can probably uh, play of dumb, like saying, well, probably I'm in the wrong room, let me figure it out, and just calmly but surely get out. And then run. <laughs> yeah. Once you're, once, you're across the, once you're across the front door, just run. <laughs> All right. Uh, I have a question actually, Henry, for you. What's yep? How like what's the most complicated step you've taken in order to to to, to infiltrate a, a company? For example, in my case, I think one of the the things that I went like above and beyond was so i had this company i had to hack into and they had an outsourced it company i went through the trouble of, of doing OSINT on the it company and actually print out a shirt and badge for that company in order to hack them how far have you gone in order to get into a building any war story uh, you might want to share? i do have one that already was done and i am actually preparing another one in which I'll be going to the data center of a bank and I'll be trying to hack directly into the data center instead of the bank because the security at the bank is crazy. The security at the data center is lax, which is kind of weird because it's usually the other way around. Like you have super high security uh, on the data center and not so much on, on, on the HQ of the bank. In this case, I have it the other way around. So I'll be going to the data center with a fake badge and a couple of other things. Um, but in the past, probably the one that I had to do the most for a single engagement, there's two things that I did that one of them I love and as soon as I'm able to do it again, I will, which is uh, in your talk, you mentioned about a Dropbox, basically a Raspberry Pi with Kali and everything else. Which, and you also yeah. mentioned it. <clears throat> what? No, go ahead, go ahead. And you also mentioned a drone. So one time what I did is hook up the Dropbox to the drone, just connect the server that allowed me to drop the payload and just took the drone, flew to the roof, left it there, took the drone back and I had a Dropbox on the roof uh, with internet access, but knowing that nothing was gonna happen to it because it was like in, in a really densely populated area, there was all concrete, no way of, it's a big building and everything is concrete on the outside. There's no way of leaving that hidden somewhere. So what I ended up doing this, yes, attach it to the drone, fly to the roof, leave it there, fly back. And then I was able to hack remotely. Um, one cool. quick mention about that. I used a battery pack with a solar panel attempting to uh, get the most out of it uh, for the longest time. And that was kind of a bad idea because the constant sunlight ended up uh, not bursting, but you know, like right before a uh, LiPo battery explodes, it basically inflates a lot. <laughs> so yeah, I was, I was, um, when I went to pick it up back with the drone, flew over there, catch it, fly back. And then when I'm unpacking everything, I realized like, this is about to explode. So I'm definitely going to try that the whole drone and, and dropping it on the roof again. 
but this time I'm probably gonna find some shade or something because I I almost lost the entire Dropbox. Uh, and even worse, I could have started a fire. And now, well, luckily, for me, uh, luckily for me, the box it was in was fireproof. I, I was thinking about exactly that. So I put it in a fireproof proof box. So I, at least I want to believe that even in the worst case scenario, nothing bad would have happened. Um, and I also once ended up going into uh, construction building. So I had, I had the luck that the same company that hired me was basically remodeling the building right next to them, both belonging to them, both projects hired by them. So I asked if it was okay, and it was a similar situation, like Wi-Fi was way high up, too much interference, I even hooking up a, a Yagi antenna uh, didn't actually give me like a reliable connection to it because the office, even though one of the buildings was theirs, the new building that they were building, the previous one uh, they were renting. So the office was like the top floor. And this was before I came up with the drone idea. So in that time, uh, I actually went into the uh, construction building similar uh, attire that I use for other engagements, just a high visibility vest, stuff like that, went up. I actually had to buy a, a harness because they required uh, the, the guys in the construction to wear a harness because it was a high rise building. So I actually got myself a harness. I already, which is probably something important to mention, I had already worked in construction. I actually was allowed because this, this didn't happen in the US, this happened back home and you need a special credential for that. Luckily for me, I already had that credential. So I was allowed to operate heavy machinery. I was allowed to uh, climb on a construction building. So that made it a lot easier and said, well, after working construction, I moved into hacking. I still had those credentials. So I said, might as well use them. So I, got into the construction site, much like any other worker there, with uh, a bunch of small devices, much like the ones you showed, uh, Wi-Fi jungle, Raspberry Pi, stuff like that, hidden in a bunch of uh, different pockets or on the vest. Just went to the highest floor, installed the Raspberry Pi over there, and went back out. And that was probably, yeah, that was as far as I gone to uh to target a firm pretty cool so i actually had the, that idea of using the the solar panel i'm actually i recently got one so i'm in the process of testing and uh with the the battery testing the input output see how long it, how long it could last and why not but also keep in mind the, the temperature and whatnot i don't want to blow up the battery yeah, definitely. In my case, one of the things that probably would have helped is also adding uh, cooling, like active cooling to the whole box instead of just a really small fan on the Raspberry Pi and that's it. Uh, also, the quality. I got like a really cheap solar uh, solar panel battery pack. Maybe getting okay. a good quality one will, will avoid those issues. Gonna give it a try. If anything, I'll let you know. Awesome. All right, question for me regarding the Spark. What other requirements are you need an Arduino module for besides the USB? No, no, no. All you need is is pretty much just the the D, the DD Spark. And actually, didn't we record the the talk that you did, Ms. Kisma, uh, Danielle, for for the the Arduinos? Yes, I did the the privy on the Arduinos and the DigiSpark. Um, let me see if I can dig it up, and um, I'd be happy to share it with you guys if you like. Or it actually may already be on the YouTube channel. I'll go take a look. Oh, yeah, um, but you do not you do not need the physical Arduino. You need the Arduino IDE to answer your question, Elias. Yeah, the, the little USB device you can get them. I've seen them for as cheap as like two dollars, and even 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 cheaper than that, you can get them for like a dollar if you buy them in bulk uh, through um, 
what site did I get it through? Alibaba or something like that? I don't know. I remember. You said you got it through Alibaba. Um, I bought some from, I think I got a batch from eBay and they were all bad. I got like uh, two batches of five, right? Um, the one batch of five, all five of those were bad. Um, they were two bucks a piece. Um, and then the other batch of five, all five of those were good. So it's hit or miss. No, the batch that I got, I think it was either 30 or 40 devices. I got was like, give them away all over the place. I mean, they're super cheap. Yeah. And you said you had gotten those from Alibaba. And I'm like, oh, man, I should have done that. <laughs> yep. And the plug, he says he saw 3% on Amazon. That's not bad. But That's you can't get them cheaper. You yeah. can't get them cheaper. Yeah. So um, do you guys know what the shipping's like from Alibaba these days? Is it, uh, I mean, it was slow before, but it, has the COVID thing made it impossible? Yeah, it made it a lot worse. It used to be like less than 20 days. And yeah. right now I'm at day, almost 40 days waiting for uh, something that I purchased through wow. Alibaba. So yeah, it looks bad. All right. Um, also, yeah, any, uh, go ahead. I'll say shipping anything from overseas to the United States is kind of slow right now. Um, that latest Raspberry Pi 4 that I, I ordered that has 8 gigs of RAM, that's been in transit now for a little over a month. Mm. Wow. Um, also, oh, I know what I was going, um, not so much a question for you, uh, Henry, but I was going to offer it up. I also did a talk on setting up the SPF, DCAM, and DMARC uh, records, a um, little bit stuff on your DNS and getting the domain and the um, all of that set up. So if anybody wants a copy of that, I don't think I recorded it, but I have a slide deck um, and I would be happy to do a session on that if you guys like. And we got the rest of the year for presentations, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> obviously but <laughs> yeah that's another thing we actually we need prezies guys uh any talk any presentation session that you want to do um offer yourself up like i was mentioning in chat i was actually thinking about anybody who you know, would consider the concept of doing maybe a blue team talk i like wouldn't mind hopping on something like that so we always do these red team talks but maybe we should also show some kind of defensive or as mac put it uh purple team talk yeah purple team seems to be the new big thing yeah, um, South Florida ISSA um, had a talk, um, part of that was on Thursday night, um, and that was a really good talk. They did some purple team there, so. Cool. Hey, guys, how are you? I wish they would make it back. Yay! <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, we need, we need, uh, we, we need presentations, guys. Um, I was hoping that we could go back on August. Uh, chatter uh, this week indicates that they're reclosing and that is not good news. So we had to be prepared in case we can go back to physical meetings. So uh, please submit to um, to us uh, for uh, new presentations. I'm going to post a uh, invite for everybody to join um, the Discord channel. We're trying to put all the uh, the percent 27s together. Hold on, let me. Uh, is there a chat here? Yeah, there is. Uh, oh, there it is. Hold on. So here we go. Uh, that's the invite guy. It would last uh, 24 hours. Uh, so all of you are invited. Uh, and uh, yeah, we need. I is, was this the second presentation, Danielle, or is it the first one? That was the second, second. presentation. Oh, oh, okay. oh, thank you guys. Thank you, uh, David and, and Henry. Henry has been amazing this year. He's he's brought us all kinds of leadness to uh, <laughs> <laughs> from drones to parking drones on top of buildings. That's pretty freaking awesome, dude. So uh, yeah, uh, guys, send us your your ideas. Join the Discord, um, and then uh, I was gonna ask you, Danielle. What's up with the hack the flag? Is this not going to happen? Is it going to be virtual? 
I did, I did announce it at the beginning a little bit, but it is going to be virtual. It's going to be October 3rd, I believe. And mm -hmm. um, I can slap a link in here. Uh, we have a mailer that's going out soon. Uh, the CTF is going to be virtual. It's going to be uh, popped up on the server. We'll probably put it on uh, CTF time and a couple other places. You're shaking your head no. Why are you shaking your head no? Me? <laughs> No, there's another person on camera. Oh, so, okay. Right. Um, the uh, the chili cook-off portion, on the other hand, <laughs> seems to be problematic virtually, but <laughs> we'll make some good suggestions on that. Awesome. And I did forget, uh, thanks for posting the Discord uh, invite. I totally, I knew there was something I forgot to do, and it was the Discord link. Sorry about that. Yeah, we 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 guys we the idea is eventually to move to discord um the slack is all right but they they caught us off on messages and features so uh i'm just waiting for the discord to be we'll migrate over and then we'll, we'll have it as a backup basically cool stuff so the only issue I have with the online version of doing any of the CTFs is that the uh, the last seat, the Winter Hack Fest that we had, mm -hmm. the, the the team I was on, we were dominating up until like the last hour when uh, I don't know who it was that showed up and he had like 30, 40 people online in uh, remote locations that just there was no competition. I mean, I had four people at my table and this guy had a crap ton of people on his team. Oh wow. You know, Rod, you talked about that. That's uh, you were talking about, like when um, was it the Black Hat CTF that? That was that was during Defcon. One time we were playing <laughs> Open CTF in Vegas, and uh, there was a team that had a basically they were putting a wireless antenna into one of the the uh, Riviera hotels, and they had like 30, 40 people playing for them. They were just sitting and drinking beer, and then. You were looking at the score war and they were going up, 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 and we were like pulling our hair. So that's the problem when you do online CDFs that you can avoid, you know, people bringing their friends, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's hard. So they should put a limit on the number of teammates you have. Yeah. Oh, okay. How yeah. you? How would you check that? <laughs> it would be kind of difficult. I agree, especially if there are like, they just sign up and have 12 teams, but they're all really helping out the one team. That would kind right. of suck, but it's difficult. I understand where you're coming from with that. It just That's why I like the physical, which I understand is not as cost effective anymore. Nevertheless. Is it still going to be cash prizes, Daniel? As far as I know, yes. Uh, we have our um vendor sponsor packages put together and almost ready to send out so if there's anybody on the call that wants to be a vendor sponsor uh hit me up for that and uh, we definitely need vendors um so we'll get uh, a little creative with that and yeah all right that's all what i have for you today stay safe and uh, we'll see how this goes Thanks, yeah. guys. Thank you, Dave and Henry. You did such a great job. You're very welcome. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Good job, Dave. Thank you. Yeah, good job, Dave. Thank you. Any questions, reach out on Slack. Or Discord. Or Discord. <laughs>